In 2007, the English actor Edward Petherbridge went to New Zealand to rehearse the role of King Lear. Part of Laurence Olivier's National Theatre Company in the 1960s, and later the Royal Shakespeare Company, he had played Lear's fool, but never before played the king himself. However, two days into rehearsals, Petherbridge suffered a stroke which left him barely able to move. As he began his difficult recovery, he discovered he had retained word for word the part of Lear in his mind. My perfect mind is a play about not playing King Lear. I fear I am not in my perfect mind, Lear tells his daughter Cordelia, when they are reconciled near the end of the play. Created by the experimental theatre company told by an idiot, my perfect mind tells Petherbridge's life story through the prism of Shakespeare's tragedy. Following the success of its first run last year, it returns to the Young Vic Theatre in London before touring England. Whose idea was it? The sort idea. of your idea, really. Sorts of my idea, but provoked by Edward having an idea. I wanted to salvage the Lear that I never did, and I didn't think anybody would ask me to do it, you know. Which was a very good idea. That I could see the two of us doing uh, And um, he could play the fool in everybody. And you said, I've got a much better idea. Uh, we could do a, a show about you not doing Lear. What was my bedrock was that when we'd worked together, without saying anything, right. it just was right. Pete, do you know something, Mr. Pete? Yes. You're going to make a terrific Lear. We would have ideas for comic, we would come out of the ether, at us for my osmosis. Um, we did have the security mm. of that in a way, and it, I don't want it to sound too lovey-dovey, and of course we hate each other really, but... <laughs> but um, <laughs> There is that um, trust, and um, also it's, there's no rivalry much. No, no, <laughs> no. Because also we're very different, and I think that's what people have responded to. Here we are, sir. Home, Bradford. That'll be £3,500, or in old money, two and six. I was always trying to shovel in more of King Lear. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul was trying to get a little bit more of something else into it. That was the real sort of tussle of how much Lear we could get in and under what circumstances and under what conditions. A key thing for me was when, again, Catherine in rehearsal kept talking about the notion that whenever we go into the Lear bits, however we're presenting them, whether it's me as a German doctor or whatever, that when we're in the Lear, we should commit to the Lear like that's all we're doing. It's like you are doing the best production of King Lear you possibly can. Under the circumstances. Absolutely. And, and for me, even, that's really it, crucial. Even if it is under yeah. the circumstances yeah. and I rather than above Absolutely. Them. And I think you have to commit to that. Even if I'm playing Cordelia at the end in my tracksuit with you know, boot polish on my face from the residue of Laurence Olivier, I have to commit to being like Cordelia. Lot. But when I get home to you, I find the things that you do will make me feel all right. To Lawrence, I didn't realise you were here. I've just popped in from a matinee of... Oh, Desdemona! Oh, Desdemona! I see you looking at me, Edward, like my performance is somehow borderline offensive. Not in 1964. Very good. Well, I've... I met Edward and heard that he'd written a 600-page autobiography since his stroke. So we had sort of two Bibles in rehearsal. One was uh, King Lear, Shakespeare's Lear, and the other was Slim Chances and Unscheduled Appearances by Edward Petheridge. My contribution in terms of shaping it was suggesting that these are our source materials, plus the other big source material was this relationship. Edward, who'd worked with uh, Laurence Olivier and his company, and um, to all intents and purposes, uh, conventional classical actor, his improvisatory skills were sort of extraordinary. And together, um, I just went, this is gold. This is absolute gold. How fair is your majesty? You do me wrong to take me out of the grave. Thou art a soul in bliss, but I am bound upon a wheel of fire that mine own tears do scald like molten lead. Having had a go at Leah myself when I was ridiculously young, the so-called cliché of playing Leah is like climbing a mountain. I thought, yes, yes, let's kind of follow that through in a sort of literal sense. So that th there's this quest. We start with this quest of, I want to play King Leah. And I thought, what does it mean to want to play King Leah? I suppose it's 
um, uh, 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 like the person who wants to climb Mount Everest or to um, get a gold in the Olympics, or it's it's the it's that aspiration thing. We'll start with something simple. Can you do this? Then the other notion that came to mind was that in the, in the world of stroke, as it were, it's a word that's off balance. So we talked with Michael Vale, the uh, designer, about how we could translate that into a kind of visual, physical sense. And this idea of this stage that, was, um, that would make things difficult. <laughs> would make people literally off balance. That was always a, a, something to negotiate. In stroke, a certain part of the brain will be affected and it may be that all of those functions are looked after by different brain regions or networks. So it's perfectly possible for the network that affects movement to be affected and sparing uh, the parts of the brain that are necessary to, for long-term memory or, or language, for example. Ambulance. I mean, we can think of rehabilitation as a process of learning or relearning some of the things that are lost. I think one of the things the arts uh, add is uh, a form of motivation. It, makes the, it would make aspects of the rehabilitation more engaging and so people are more likely to, to carry on trying to relearn. I think the other thing that the arts will do, uh, particularly music, I think, is it will connect people to um, themselves before they had the stroke. And I think engaging with some of those aspects really helps people to try and remember who they are. Motivation is a really important part of rehabilitation. And having a, a goal to achieve is also a really important part. And it seemed that he just transferred the goal of learning a part to, this, to the rehabilitation process. Come on, like this will win the Turner Prize. I have been in devised shows before, and some of them have been hardly devised, really, sort of, you know. It's a very odd area. Well, I suppose for me a devised show is... It's I mean, when you walk into the room, room you have no script. Yes, you're starting from an idea. You have a back of an envelope. Yeah, like we had, in a sense, we had that we began with the notion of Edward having this stroke and not playing King. So it started in reality, if you like. You tell me you've done shows where you literally had a phrase on a... Yeah, sometimes we started from a very small... And I think what it... Small premise. Yeah, and it requires enormous trust. Golden rule in improvisation is, if somebody says, hello, mother, <laughs> your mother, or if we're here, we're in the chapel or in the abattoir, that's where you are. No wonder it turned out to be somewhat surreal occasionally, but the only point of being surreal is that you're ultra-real in the end. Mind is such a limited medium. I remember a particular rehearsal at the National Theatre when I thought, outside this theatre there, on the edge of the Thames, there are the law courts, St Paul's, House of Parliament, several hospitals, police stations, where people's lives are being changed. But here, for this moment, in this room, I'm watching this moment of Chekhov, which is so hyper-real, that it's realer than everything that's happening outside in the real world. And, of course, when you get actors talking about that hermetically sealed magic world, it can be a, such a pain in the arse. But, of course, it is absolutely the, the magic talisman that keeps us all going, because, because it does relate to that real world. And um, however fantastic this is, that's what we hope it relates to. Fourth score. What is madness and who is truly mad? From long before Shakespeare's time to the present day, we have used art as a way to express and to try to understand the workings of the human mind. But despite great medical advances, it remains a shady area for both art and science. This is a play about our fragility and immense resilience. Perhaps we will never be in our perfect mind. Perhaps it's these quirks, frailties and moments of madness that make us truly human.